Tonight, we talk to a retired police sergeant who offers some criticisms of J. Warner Wallace and shares his thoughts about whether being a police detective qualifies someone to determine anything at all about Jesus. Spoiler alert, it doesn't. But I mean seriously, isn't that obvious to like everybody? This is Zadanza. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to Zadanza. Um, I am the Zod in Zadanza. The Dan is somewhere else. Today, we are joined, sorry, other side, by a guest named Sergeant Skeptic. Um, he is coming here to, number one, I want to give him a little exposure because he has a really cool YouTube channel. We'll talk about all that. Um, so he's here to just chat with us a little bit. Um, talk about what he does and what he's all about on YouTube. And of course, we're going to spill a little bit of the tea about Jay Warner Wallace, um, which as a lot of you know, I've gotten a little in a little bit of a kerfuffle with him about uh, his routine and his experience. Sergeant Skeptic is, I understand, a retired police sergeant and has had some things to say about that as well. So we're going to let him draw from his police experience, uh, bestow his rich fount of knowledge on us and talk about <laughs> both from a po police officer's perspective, but also just a general New Testament perspective, what he thinks about the whole thing. So welcome, Sergeant Skeptic. Oh, thank you. I hope I live um, up to am... that uh, introduction. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've been, I've been looking forward to having you here for a while because um, you know, I think we, we have different areas that we like to emphasize on all this, but I was really, really curious when you messaged me and I learned that an actual former police officer has things to say about this whole thing. Um, and so I was looking forward to the chance of having you on. Dan, being on vacation now kind of gave us that opportunity. So, okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So first off, um, you have a YouTube channel, right? Uh, tell us, you want to tell us a little bit about that and what got you started on that? Yeah, sure. So I, I have a YouTube channel. I've only been doing YouTube about six to nine months. It's Sergeant Skeptic, which I personally believe is kind of corny, but it's what I could come up with and, you know, sort of related. Um, I went through the police academy in Southern California in 1985, and I retired after 30 years in law enforcement um, in 2015 at the rank of sergeant. Um, and, you know, I started this YouTube channel uh, because I had a few things to say about the claims of Christianity and um, claims of the New Testament and whether those were true or not. And I kind of did model this YouTube channel, you know, using my law enforcement background, but mostly in a way to kind of refute the claims of Jay Warner Wallace, who was one of the very first Christian apologists that I started to study and read. I read his book as one of the very first things I did in uh, my own, you know, kind of, I, I, don't, I can't use the word deconversion from Christianity because I... Uh, grew up in a non-religious home, uh, got into Christianity through marriage and family and and children. and uh, but it was always very skeptical. So but when I, you know, kids grew up, moved out of the house, I retired, I had a lot more time on my hands, and I really kind of wanted to know, hey, is is this faith that I've been going to church through and 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 hanging around Christian people? Is it true? Is the resurrection really true? Are the claims of Christianity true? And I did get very interested in that. I'm still interested in that. And I find the whole thing actually quite fascinating. Um, but my YouTube channel is kind of, I don't overdo the law enforcement. I really want to talk about the New Testament, the Old Testament, the Bible, the claims of Christianity. That's what I really want to talk about. But I, I do mention uh, my law enforcement um, career. Um, and then I get a little bit heavier into it when I'm criticizing Jay Warner Wallace, which if you go to my channel, and I really hope you do, you'll see a lot of his pictures in my thumbnail, and it kind of became a, a sort of a natural 
point for me to start. I, I kind of, I don't want to be too thrown around pejoratives too much, but I, I kind of look at him a little bit as a useful idiot for kind of structuring my own thoughts and arguments. And um, it's not so much about criticizing him. It's about structuring my own stuff. And he just makes that really kind of easy to do, in my opinion. You know, what you describe is pretty common for YouTubers, finding what you've called a useless not useless, useful idiot. Uh, you know, part of what we're doing is helping people understand the claims of Christianity and stuff we grew up or, you know, spent some time immersed in. And so having an actual Christian to bounce that off of, I think that really helps do that and helps us. It gives us a starting point and then it helps us do more than just talk about Christianity in the abstract. So I think that's mm -hmm. a pretty good approach. Uh, one thing I'll say just, just right off the bat, um, he has a, he, your channel is still pretty small. I think a, a few, how, how many subscribers do you have at this point? Um, I think I might be, you know, I'm not a real, it's kind of funny. Law enforcement have statistics all the time. You know, how many arrests you've made, how many citations. And I don't really pay much attention to that, but I, I do think I might be closing in on 500 or right around 500 subscribers, which, you know, I was going for quite a long time with, um without any subscribers, you know, so I feel really, yeah. you know, like, wow, this is going great, you know? So, but yeah, when I, mean, I look at, uh, you know, like Trent Horn, I, I look at his podcast. Sometimes he's a Catholic apologist, you know, he posts a video and in an hour he's got, you know, 20,000 views. So I'm a, you know, I don't know that that's ever going to happen, but I feel pretty good that, you know, I post a video and within two or three days, there's 300 views on that. Now that doesn't mean 300 people watch the whole thing, but at least 300 people, you know, we're interested enough to hear what I have to say. So that's motivating to me. And, you know, I just want to, I have a few things to say. And if somebody wants to listen to them, Hey, I would love for you to visit my channel. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. And I was at like a sub 100 to just over a hundred for a long, long time. Like this stuff takes time. But yeah. one thing I'll say about your channel, and I want to make sure I say this to the audience. Um, what you do, I feel, is a little similar to me and that we both have somewhat instructional approaches. It's very straightforward, matter of fact, getting down to the point. And you're one of the few channels. I've, I've read the Bible all the way through. I've been in it constantly since childhood. You're one of the few people who picks things out of the Bible and explains something that I'd never really thought of before. And we'll probably get into a couple examples of that today. So if you want to understand the New Testament just a little bit better, or maybe other parts of the Bible, if you've ever gone into, you know, the Old Testament or anything, um, he would definitely want to look at, because there are a lot of little things that he says that just click in my head and like, wow, the, the way John wrote that uh, doesn't make sense if he was an eyewitness or, you know, this, this kind of thing or that about the motivations of the disciples that apologists draw conclusions about. Uh, you really, you find that one little thing and hit on it just right in a very precise way. So I think that's really good. That's one thing that stuck out and I would encourage people to go check it out and subscribe if you like what you you're seeing. Thank you. Um, so you said, I think you gave us a sense of your religious background already. Um, you got started a little later in life. Your yeah. story sounds remarkably like Wallace's except a lot more realistic, to be frank. Uh, yeah. In terms of going there for family reasons later on in life, um, having this thirst to discover the truth, um, I just find that a little striking. I don't know if there's a question in there for you, but it's interesting. Well, and I feel like, go ahead. Yeah. Well, you brought it up. You know, our, both our law enforcement careers were really over the same time period, the same location. Um, <clears throat> just my, we we're both in Southern California. <clears throat> he did work for a much bigger police department than I did. I worked for a much smaller one. Um, but our, our, I don't know about his upbringing. I did not grow up in a religious home at all. I mean, zero, it was, but that's, I don't know about his growing up, but certainly he talks about, you know, marriage and family was a reason for him to start going to church. Um, I did not really study the Bible when I was going to church, and I never told my kids that this is true. I just brought them to church. Um, I started really studying the Bible 
after I, uh, I was still going to church when I started studying it, but when I really wanted to know was later on in life, you know, when I was closer to retirement, I think, you know, I was around 40, 45 years old when I really started, you know, wanted to know if it was true. And I've always been very skeptical prior to that. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, yeah, it's, I'd say the big thing that sounds different and we'll get off of this, we'll move on to more, sure, uh, sure. more of the substance of our stream, but, uh, I like that yours, you seem to be, yours, your experience and your search into the facts has taken you to a more skeptical position, but I hear you express it as if you're on a more open-ended journey and you're still trying to learn, which is a lot different than concluding extremely specific things that just happened to line up with apologetics. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, so think, I think, go ahead. This is, this is one of my real criticisms of Jay Warner Wallace. Um, it's about honesty and it's about being objective and not changing the evidence. These are the core values of law enforcement. Yeah, I have no problem with his brand of cold case Christianity. I have no problem with his police anecdotes and, you know, how he kind of uses law enforcement stories to kind of shape his arguments about the New Testament. What I really, truly have a problem with and why I want to say something is that he changes the evidence. He quotes the New Testament, but he's changed what it actually says. In his book, I have videos that point out that where he, you know, he he edits um, he puts in his book information out of like first Corinthians chapter nine that is beneficial to his argument, but the verses before that and the verses after that are not beneficial to his argument. So he edits those out. And this really bothers me. This is what we call hiding the ball in law enforcement and it's nefarious conduct where you hide evidence that would be helpful to the defense of a criminal defendant. You don't tell anybody about it. And uh, then you only present the evidence that, you know, could potentially lead to a conviction. And this is goes against the absolute grain of the ethics of law enforcement, that we have to provide all of the evidence and objectively. Um, and if the suspect, if we can't prove a suspect's guilty, well, then we don't have a case and we have to live with that, whether we like it or not. And Jay Warner Wallace does not do that. He changes the evidence, ignores uh, that which is against his um, case and highlights the evidence in favor of his case. And all, all of my videos that have his thumb, a uh, picture on the thumbnail will, will demonstrate this in one way or another. He's so consistent at doing that, that there's a lot of examples. And so I have different examples in different videos. I don't need to see, use the same one over and over. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. I think that's a good point. There's, there's really nothing wrong with using police stories to spice up and give illustrations, right? Just to illustrate and make it sound a little more exciting. Yeah. I think, I think like you said, the problem is when he fudges or also I think he goes overboard with insinuating or saying how much that those police experiences qualify him to speak to the new Testament. So I think you've already answered my first question going into mm -hmm. Wallace yeah. and his gimmick, which is kind of about overall, what do you think about the whole thing? But I want to run something by you and the audience, which is what I personally think his process is watching him from experience. And by okay. the way, I'm very sorry that reading his book was the first thing that you experienced in apologetics or that you have read that book <laughs> because I, I tried, you know, I, I see apologetics a lot. On, on various short forms or presentations or whatever. And I try to dive into books and it is just so tedious. Like it's the exact same apologetics over and over again with yeah. like, I don't know. Congratulations for getting through that. And thank you for your service. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, be because it was the, because it was the first thing that I had read, um, it wasn't tedious at that time. It was new. And like I, when I read that book, I did not know who Paul was. I wouldn't have been able oh, to explain okay. the difference, but you know, I was that naive or, or ignorant, I guess you could say is I did not know the difference between an epistle or a gospel when I first started this research. Um, so 
Yeah. So I, when I read his book, I said, well, he's making all kinds of arguments here. I have no idea. Maybe this is all true. You know, who, who's this Paul guy? You know, what's that all about? That, I mean, that's literally where I started at like 45 years old. Oh, OK. That's a very different experience than I was picturing then. Um, oh, yeah. No, I knew that, nothing. That, that was my experience reading the Bible. I'd grown up like just steep in the Bible from day one. But oh, when yeah. I opened it Not and me. read it cover to cover, that was a brand new experience. And I'm sure for you, Wallace's book was had a little bit of that same newness to it. Like I could see how there'd be a certain curiosity in unpacking that for the first time. Oh, yeah. I mean, some of the stuff when I first read it, hey, that makes total sense to me. But now I know that, hey, wait, there. I know what the counter arguments are. And I know where he's fudging the evidence quite a bit, too. So, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, I was really kind of like a 10 year old, basically, you know, you could have told me anything. I wouldn't have known whether it was true or not. But now I think I'm a little bit more well researched on the whole thing. Yeah, that's where for me, it was a more painstaking experience because I not only grown up in Christianity, but in college, I got into apologetics myself. Then I analyzed them from all kinds of sides as an atheist and a YouTuber. By the time I got to Wallace, these were like the most common knowledge things I could tell he just plucked out of, you know, church circles and put a code of policing over. And I yeah, found that's it exactly what he did. <laughs> that's exactly what he did. 100%. <laughs> so we have a super chat. I want to acknowledge Michael Beverly. Hey, Zod and Sergeant. I brought, I bought Jay Warner Wallace's book and Sergeant Skeptic and I are going to talk about it. Assuming he's still interested after I read. So. Yeah, Thank Michael Beverly reached out to me. So, you know, I, I got all these new friends that I didn't have before. Um, so this brings us, I think, naturally to what I'm going to call Wallace's process. And I want to get your feedback on this. Audience in the chat, if you have thoughts on this too. But this is just, I don't know. The, the, the facts are the important thing, like you said. But I am really curious when I see him do his thing, what he's up to. And this is kind of where I think he goes. So I want to get your feedback on it. So I don't think really his narrative of starting as a cold case detective and diving into the Bible and uncovering the clues makes much sense. What I think more happened is uh, basically he starts with a really basic apologetic. And I think I say basic very deliberately because Every argument he makes at its core is extremely ground level things you've heard around a church a million times. If you've read William Lane Craig, Josh McDowell, any of these guys, everything you say, he's basically picked up off the floor and it didn't take any work to arrive at the actual conclusions. Um, but then what he does is he finds an analogy um, to some part of police work that he can connect it to. And I think this is where he turns it into a more unique shtick. And, uh, and and so basically there has to be some through line between that apologetic and uh, policing. Go ahead. You look like you're going to say oh, something. Oh, no, I, 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 no, 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 not at all. I was doing all these nervous okay. little scratches. Sorry, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, you're good. Um and by the way, audience, Dan's not here, so I can do PowerPoints all I want and nobody can stop me. So just live with it. Uh, <laughs> and then he explains policing specifically to make that analogy fit. So he starts off with a really basic argument, takes no work to arrive at it, connects it to police work. And then we're going to see some examples of this, some clips. And I want to get your feedback about that specifically based on your experience as an officer. Um, he says things about policing that to me sound kind of dubious. And I feel like he's doing that specifically to validate conclusions about apologetics and make it sound like his detective work uh, plausibly allowed him to arrive at these conclusions. Mm -hmm. um, fi finally, of course, he tells anecdotes tying it to his professional experience. So it's not enough to explain how uh, policing or, you know, detection, whatever you call detective work, uh, draws you to the conclusion that Jesus lived and was God. But when he ties it to his experience, when he tells stories about what he did, I did this as a police officer. I went to the Bible and did the same thing. And wow, I discovered that Jesus existed and was the Lord of the universe. Um, I think that's an important aspect of it because a lot of his routine is tied to 
we don't want to focus on the person, but that's what his routine does is ties it to a, all to his credibility. And then of course, tell a version of his personal story that gives that whole narrative credibility. And addressing this was a big thing I had done on my main channel in terms of the timeline of his career and things like that. So do you have any thoughts from your perspective on all that? Yeah, I mean, I, I have kind of a lot of thoughts. So, so I'm really well versed in law enforcement and I, I, will, I will spend a little time. I want to be objective and fair. So there's something I'm going to say that, that defend Detective Wallace or J. Warner Wallace, Jim Wallace, and uh, some things that I'm very critical of. The main thing that I'm critical of is this changing of the evidence when he's presenting his arguments and hiding evidence that does not go along with his case. That really bothers me. Um, his apologetics are very basic. Now, this is one thing I think maybe there is a little bit of a void in the skeptic community, certainly not a huge void. And there's plenty of people out there that are filling this void, but maybe we don't always have the best arguments, um, from the new Testament that refute these basic apologetic claims. For instance, the apostles had absolutely nothing to gain or nothing to gain. The apostles had nothing to gain is a very basic Christian argument. And I think that maybe there's a little bit of a void that no, the New Testament depicts all kinds of things that they were gaining out of preaching the gospel, you know, starting with first Corinthians chapter nine. I mean, it's basically stated right there. Those who preach the gospel should make their living from the gospel. And so I tried to fill that void a little bit. Um, so I am talking a lot of very, about very basic apologetic stuff in my videos, but from a different point of view, a skeptic point of view and trying to fill in the evidence that the celebrity apologist is not giving you. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, the, the cold case thing, listen, everything that Jim Wallace says leads me to believe that he was an absolutely successful law enforcement detective in Southern California. There's nothing he says that I go, wait a minute, time out. That's, that's, um, what is very different about law enforcement than Christian apologetics is how many people are holding you accountable in police work. If you're putting a case together, your supervisors are going to hold you accountable to that. Then the court system um, is going to hold you accountable to that. The district attorney's office, the public defender's office, the private, you know, a defense attorney that gets hired, they're all going to be holding you accountable. That is one very different thing about police work that does not exist in Christian apologetics. These guys don't hold each other accountable. Uh, my last video is, was a conversation. I kind of used it as a structure to, you know, to make my argument that Christianity is not true is a conversation between Jay Warner Wallace and Sean McDowell. And Jay Warner Wallace in there, he changes the evidence in John's gospel. Uh, it's in the video. I hope you watch that. The thumbnail has the three of their picture, uh, the three of our pictures on there. You can't miss it. But he quotes John's gospel. John's gospel is written in the third person. And for his own purposes, Jay Warner Wallace switches the pronouns to first person because that fit his story a little bit better. That's what Sean McDowell, a PhD in Christian apologetics, should have held him accountable for, but he didn't. So that's something that's really missing in, in Christian apologetics is, with the exception of maybe Mike Lacona, who I really have some respect for, a Christian guy, but he does hold people accountable sometimes. Goes, Wait a minute, there's another side of that. Um, another guy who does this is Randall Rouser, a, a Christian apologist. And he will criticize Christians when they make bad arguments. But generally speaking, these celebrity apologists that we see don't hold each other accountable, don't criticize each other's arguments. And they're just in this, you know, echo chamber of ideas. And that's very different than law enforcement. Everything you do gets scrutinized by the news media, the public, your supervisors, police managers and the court system. So there's a lot of accountability. Um, I hope I'm not rambling on and on, but that is a major difference in why he gets away with this. And you wouldn't get away with that in police work. You know, you would get tripped up too many times and it doesn't take too many times before the district attorney's office is making a phone call to the chief of police saying, Hey, you got problems, man. And you're going to need yeah. to straighten those problems out. You know, that happens pretty quickly if there's trouble like that. It doesn't happen at all in Christian apologetics. I 100% agree with you. And one thing I want to be clear about, <clears throat> I don't I don't mean to insinuate ever that he was a bad police officer. 
I think I have, I have some thoughts about what exactly his role is, um, whether he was as deeply involved in cases, you know, how deeply mm -hmm. involved he was in case, but I don't really care about all that stuff. I'm willing to say, fine, he was a great police officer, but I think when he comes, brings it over to apologetics, I don't think he represents it in the most accurate way. Um, I don't think that's a reflection of his ability. I think it's more of a reflection of what he's trying to do as an apologist. And I 100% agree. Nobody's holding apologists accountable. There, there are some people who will sift over fine details, but nobody's going to call anybody out for blatant dishonesty, which I think they have to see. The other aspect to it is the audience does not hold anybody accountable um, because I think the audience is in a cooperative relationship with the apologist where they kind of want to be fooled and they're looking to see the best in what the apologist says. And so I think there's just this huge accountability void and nobody, nobody's going to point and say, look what this guy's doing. Even the general public, the larger secular public, when they see us atheists or skeptics of any kind calling out apologetics, they're like, what's the point? Why do you need to be picking on these guys at church? You know, mm. they think we're just being petty. So yeah, real quick. Well, I uh, think it... Andrew Sword. And Andrew Sword, sorry, I just want to acknowledge Super Chats. Zod pulling out the hottest PowerPoints like he's the pre-run of atheism, whatever that means. But yeah, <laughs> the pre-run. Go to Google that. Yeah. So um, on accountability, I, that's what we do. You know, that's the skeptic community. We're we're the ones that are filling that void. But uh, you know, Christians are not holding each other accountable, which is another problem in law enforcement. Law enforcement officers are expected to hold each other accountable. That is the rules. Now, I'm not saying that that happens all the time, and certainly there's room for improvements, but that is an ex expectation that we hold each other accountable. And I do not see that happening with Christian apologetics. There's some rare thing about it, uh, rare, rare circumstances about it, Mike Lacona and Randall Rouser being examples. I also noticed that Jay Warner Wallace, and I actually like this, and there's a reason I like it. He's his audience is getting younger and younger and younger. He's spending a lot of time in, you know, Christian high schools talking to them about apologetics. I actually like that. I think a lot of people are going, oh, you know, he's trying to, um, you know, get these. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? My mind's gone blank. You know, try to make them, you know, believers now. But I did teach high school students. Um, ROP classes, we have that here. And I had a lot, a lot of experience teaching high school students. They will absolutely fact check you everything you say, and they'll do it right there on the, on the spot. And so, you know, when he's talking to these high school students, I'm thinking, yeah, they can't fact check them right now because it's a Christian high school. But as soon as school's over, they're going to be on their phones. And I appreciate that because, you know, then the people who are holding the apologists accountable, which is us, they have access to that information. And I think that's useful to get this conversation going. And yeah, let's bring young people into it. And, you know, with the internet and social media, we have the ability to do that now, or we didn't before. Yeah. And I think that's one of the biggest reasons why the church is bleeding numbers is any, any kid can quietly go start watching YouTube videos or just look up a claim they heard over the pulpit. And that makes all the difference yeah. in the world. And they do uh, it. Shannon, I I don't know if you're familiar with Shannon Q, a friend of mine, says there's a difference in audience. I love atheists will turn on me with breakneck speed if I'm wrong or dishonest. <laughs> and I think that's not always the case. You know, some, be some people give you a little bit of room, but usually if you're wrong on something, and this is something, if you haven't discovered it yet, you will as your channel grows, they will, they will eat you alive if you, even if you just honestly get a detail wrong, they'll jump on it with varying levels of graciousness. But if you're openly dishonest, you're in the wrong audience. You're in the wrong uh, market. <laughs> yeah. So I think there was some some young woman that got caught kind of plagiarizing everything. You know, we all kind of do, you know, skeptics sound a little bit the same, too. Um, I lost my train of thought. I do that all the time now. That's one of the habits of 61 years old. But, um, you know, accountability is an important thing. Oh, the comments, you know, I've been held accountable in comments. I've definitely had comments. I appreciate that. Um, you know, you, you can't be a police officer if you've got thin skin or, and are worried about, you know, what people might have to say about you. One of my other little 
careers that I had. I was a soccer referee uh, for a long time, and you can't do that, um, you know, at the high school or college level if you're thin-skinned. So I don't mind people criticizing me. I kind of like that because sometimes they're absolutely correct, and and I was wrong, and and you know that's how we learn and we get a little bit sharper and a little bit better. So atheists holding atheists accountable is an important part of the whole process. And we do have a comment saying depends on the audience members. I think that is 100% true. There are people who will camp behind somebody and stick with them and it actually creates infighting. Yeah. But at least compared to the uh the community that I grew up in, there's a lot more calling people out. One thing I want to just really quickly touch on and I want to make this fast. I don't want to make this the focus of the thing. Mm -hmm. But I I had I I uncovered some things about Apollo um Wallace's career and about how the he was not a cold case detective before he became a Christian, which is at least insinuated as part of his routine. You know, I was this hardened cold case detective. I had all this experience. I applied that to the Bible and it led me to the conclusion that Jesus existed. Um, I brought up the fact that according to the timeline of his career, as I was able to dig it up, he was not a cold case detective at that point. He might've worked some collateral cases, which he kind of went on this damage control tour. It looks like after I brought that up, um, but you had some feedback on that. So some of it was, some of it um, might have validated what I said, but you also had some points of clarity about where I was wrong. So I'd be interested if you shared that to the audience. Yeah, sure. So I never really questioned the whole cold case thing. I'm, I was aware, I'm aware of where he worked. Uh, and it's a pretty decent sized department for them to have a detective that was solely um, assigned to investigating cold cases did seem reasonable to me. Like they're big enough to do that. Certainly you would never see that at the department I worked. Well, we did have cold cases, but we just assigned them out to every detective. But I, I did watch your video on that. And I, I didn't necessarily agree with what you were saying. I would know Southern California law enforcement, that's very possible. And at the agency he worked at, it's big enough to where, you know, they could justify a cold case homicide detective. So that did make sense to me. But apparently you were right um, because he did. He changed his story. So it's, no, I was not a cold case homicide. I was a detective who investigated some cold cases, you know, which absolutely makes sense. So I was a little bit surprised, you know, that they, they did it that way. Um, but the whole the whole thing about cold case Christianity, that is a brand and it doesn't really apply to investigating ancient documents written in a different language that have been translated into modern English. None of that detective work applies. It doesn't mean you can't do it if you're a retired detective, but because you're a retired detective does not make you any kind of expert in analyzing ancient documents because we don't have any training in that in law enforcement at all. The one thing that Jay Warner Wallace does say very frequently that I agree with, and it's true, is the, you know, his comments about one witness making a vague statement that is later, um, you know, clarified by a secondary witness. Or he talks about the texture of a law enforcement investigation and how contradictions can actually be a very normal part of a law enforcement investigation. And so when he's making those comments, I agree with him. Yes, those are, in fact, you know, things that we see all the time when we're investigating anything from a petty theft to a robbery to a murder. Um, it's also true that if you read an Agatha Christie, Christie mystery novel, you would see the same things, you know. So it doesn't mean that that makes the, the gospel stories true. It doesn't make them true. But it, that, that, that texture, and there are plenty of examples in the Gospels of, you know, Mark writing something that gets clarified a little bit later by Matthew. There's a lot of that going on. I think they're copying one another, plagiarizing one another, and then adding their own legendary enhancements, which is something that, you know, J. Warner Wallace just categorically denies without ever really looking into it at all. But he does make some points that are true about a law enforcement investigation and that you can find that in the New Testament. Yeah. Real quick, uh, Michael Beverly, I can attest. I emailed him and he emailed me back thanking me for the comment. I think he's talking about you, by the yeah. way. Yeah, we, I know exactly who he is. I watched some of his stuff. Yeah. And said, can I dox your real first name? You've said your real first name around people a lot. Yeah, my you? name's Dana. Dana, yeah. you know, so I got I've teased as a little, maybe this, maybe this is why I'm an atheist, you know, because I got teased as a little kid because I had a girl's name. <laughs> 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 All 
Um, you made me an atheist. So one, one thing, just for the sake of being open and again holding myself accountable, which I want to do directly, um, I had part of my look into Wallace's career had been based on the fact that you spend a certain amount of time as a patrol officer and it takes a certain amount of time to become a detective. That seemed to have been borne out by some of the information I found online, but based on your experience actually working in that same area, it doesn't work exactly like that. You want to share that with the audience real quick? Yeah. So, I, I mean, it, I think this is kind of like East Coast law enforcement. We see these movies, you know, they get their detective shield and it's this kind of promotionary thing. And the Southern California is made up. There are some huge departments like the Los Angeles Police Department, the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, where it's much more structured, structured like that, where detective is like a promotion. But we're just we have tons of little police departments, municipal police departments. And that's where Jay Warner Wallace worked. And that's where I worked. And so when I became a detective, that was not a promotion at all. It was really just a lateral transfer from patrol to detective work. No, nope, there is a pay raise incentive now, but not when I was doing it. And you were just a police officer doing a different job, you know, investigating cases after the fact instead of responding to emergencies as a patrol officer. And I think this is very common in, in Southern California law enforcement. Um, the agency that I worked with, every five years, no matter what you were doing, you had to go back to working patrol. Um, so, you know, that's just how that was one of the, we called it rotation. That was one of the rules we have. Um, and right now with all the retirements, I mean, people are becoming detectives after two and three years very, very quickly. But probably Jay Warner Wallace, it does sound like he had a very robust career and did a lot of different things. That's one of the great things about law enforcement. You're not stuck in the same job year in and year out. There's other opportunities. And he does sound like he did quite a few different things, um, probably became a detective and, you know, was assigned some cold cases, which was surprising to me. Like I thought, well, they are probably big enough to have somebody that just investigates murder cases that, you know, have been are over 10 years old because yeah. you, those pile up, you know, they happen. And with, with DNA technology now, all of a sudden a case that there were no leads on, all of a sudden you know who the suspect is. Yeah. Because they're DNA. <clears throat> yeah, I, th I thought that was interesting. I had no idea that it was more of a, you get, I, I, I totally had the idea that going to detective was actually a big promotion and a yeah. permanent change in your career. Not that you were basically being rotated back and forth between patrol and detective potentially. Uh, that's a fascinating idea to me. And I hadn't heard that before. Yeah. So that's not everywhere. It's a big country and law enforcement has different structures, but, but where he and I work, that structure is prevalent. Yeah. One, one, I definitely will admit to being wrong or at least unnuanced in some of my perspectives on it. One hill I will die on until I hear otherwise is it definitely does not seem like he was working cold cases at the time that he said he was, but that's, that's really not that relevant. It, honestly, I had never started out to make that point. I stumbled onto it mm -hmm. while I was working on my video and was just more of a curiosity than anything. Yeah. Um, I, I would so like to ask him, you know, from like a police, I was a supervisor. So I was using, you know, kind of used to having somewhat confrontational conversations with officers. I'd like to ask him, listen, did you tell your kids Christianity was true? And was that part of the motivating factor for a bias that you might have? You know, if you tell your kids it's true, you're bringing them to church and you're saying, hey, Jesus is your savior because you don't want them to have sex when they become teenagers or some crap like that. You know, I, I really wonder what his answers would be to really direct questions like that. But he's a believer. Uh, you know, I don't doubt his belief. Um you know, he's a believer and he has these arguments. I just think his arguments are actually quite bad and even intellectually dishonest for sure. Yeah. I like to point that out in my videos too. So if you, if you want some specifics, you know, hit my YouTube channel. <laughs> for sure. And by the way, I think I saw people mentioning things about putting links in the chat and I don't have any mods because I'm just behind the times on that so far, but his, the link to his channel is in the description. I would definitely encourage you to go check it out. Uh, peruse his videos. If you like what you see, subscribe, and I think you'll find him a good resource. So I would like to show you a few videos, and I think you have one sure. to show as well. I just have a couple minutes clips. These are, um, the first one is him, just this barrage of him talking about police things that I thought were funny and I wanted to get your perspective on. 
Okay. Um, so we'll throw that on and I'll just pause and ask you questions as we go through it. From investigating cases over the years is that less significant crimes can be committed with a smaller degree of preparation. It's easier to plan a shoplift, for example, than it is to plan a burglary of the same store after it's closed. It's even harder to plan a successful murder. It takes time for the evil desire to mature, time to plot out the manner of death, time to obtain the right weapon, formulate a successful alibi, and dispose of the body. The more consequential the crime, the longer the fuse. Okay. Thoughts? This is so stupid. I mean, I don't even know how to react to this. I, <laughs> you know, look, the, 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 when you really think about it, he's saying it takes time to plan a successful murder. Now, you know, if you're planning on getting away with murder, yes, you might want to do some real planning. Murder is generally a crime of passion that happens in the heat of the moment. You know, two guys in a bar, one of them stabs the other guy. They've been drinking. They get in a fight over some stupid thing. These are when you investigate murder, you're generally dealing with a, a, a vast majority of the time, a crime of passion that happened. It's not planned. Two people get very angry about something and one of them ends up killing the other one. And this is very common in, in homicides everywhere from domestic violence, homicides to gang related homicides and there's a little more planning going on in a gang related homicide and certainly after the murder there's a whole lot of you know conspiracy going on to kind of you know get rid of the weapon protect the suspects um, that kind of thing but murder is not some long fuse murder very frequently you know sometimes people who murder one another are very much they know each other they have a relationship within the same families but sometimes you know i mean we're dealing with you know guys shooting each, each other in cars as they're driving down the freeway so yeah yeah i don't even know what this is just shtick here and i don't i don't know if i don't it's just it's, that's like a a very poorly done dramatic scene to make some point and i think you know it's just not true. That bugs me. Like, look, if you're trying to yeah. convince Christians Jesus is risen from the dead, well, make the arguments, but, you know, don't come up with this stupid stuff and say things that are flat out wrong. Yeah, murder is yeah. a spontaneous crime. Very frequently, not to say that there's not planned out murders. There definitely are, but very frequently they're spontaneous and happen very rapidly. Yeah, the thing that struck me about this is I know it can take some time if you really want to be deliberate about a murder, time to make sure you can get away with it. But number one, I don't see that hierarchy between robberies or burglaries take longer than a murder to plan or are shorter than the murder to plan because the more consequential, the more time it takes to plan. I also just found it totally incorrect sounding and just bizarre that he said, not planning to get away with it, but it takes time for your evil desire to mature. I just thought that sounded like frivolous nonsense. Uh, I think yeah, I mean, desire we, to mature you know, something. I mean, yeah. So I, I kind of missed it. He said that murder was this long planned out thing and that shoplifting was not planned out. I would actually say, no, actually the reverse is true. One of them murders this very serious crime, but shoplifters, a lot of times they bring in booster bags. They have a, they have a plan for, you know, uh, how to return the stuff and get some cash for it. They actually do quite a bit of planning. And now they're spontaneous shoplifters, you know, they're kleptomaniacs, but the ones that are shoplifting for profit, you look at what's going on in Los Angeles. Now these are highly planned conspiracies where these large groups of people all hit a store at the same time. And that is a lot of planning. A, a lot of murders don't have any planning at all. The planning is somebody got mad at somebody and they had a gun or a knife on them and they stabbed or shot a person that they were mad at uh, in the, in the heat of passion that, you know, so you know, shoplifting yeah. in a lot of times is more planning than a murder case. Yeah. What, so what, this is an example of what I think he does where he takes, he starts with an apologetic and then he, just he twists his description of law enforcement to fit the apologetic because mm -hmm. ultimately what he's going to go on and say here is that Jesus's appearance and what he did was obviously it took a lot of time. It took a lot of planning. So we should expect there to be a big lead up to it and then a big fallout from it. And so I think he was starting with that illustration in mind and he starts to it sounds like fudge little things about crimes in order to make that work. Um, yeah, are you maybe talking like about his new book, a, a, 
are you talking maybe about his new book, A Person of Interest? I have not read that book, but I know he's, I know some of his stuff he, is talking he, about. He proceeds with that in this video. That's, that's what he, he goes on to say is that, you know, Jesus was obviously consequential because there had to be a long time going up to the events that he did. And then there was a lot of consequence to it afterwards. Yeah. Well, this is kind of interesting to me because I do agree that Jesus probably, if you're talking about all of humanity, I think there's a very strong argument that Jesus of Nazareth has made a greater impact on the world than other any other human being in existence um, in a lot of ways. Now, that doesn't say that he's been beneficial to the world. You know, uh, solving some of the medical problems that, you know, kill children are far more beneficial or you just e seatbelts and airbags are more beneficial than anything Jesus had to say. But as far as an impact on culture um, and everything, yeah, I think Jesus probably is the most impactful person in all of history. But he's also a person, and they don't like talking about this, who had a very failed prophecy of the end of times and coming of God's kingdom. Um, I got a kind of a video in works about that right now and, and, and how you can really make a case. Jesus very clearly got Paul and got Mark to believe and Matthew that th this world is ending right now. I mean, it is over. The coming of God's kingdom is here. And then that starts getting d toned down in Luke quite a bit. And you can look at the different scriptures and go, oh, this is exactly where Luke is toning this down. He does it at the Ascension. Um, there's a line in there where he wants to tone this down because it didn't happen yet. Um, so these are things that, you know, I kind of feel like could be pointed out a little bit stronger when people are talking about the impact of Jesus. Well, what about the mistakes that Jesus makes? I get myself looking like a teetotaler because I have one video on my um, YouTube channel about the mistakes Jesus makes with alcohol. And I do very heavily hit my police experience on how many times I have seen tragedy because of people getting drunk. It's a lot of times. And, um, you know, so it's all about the wedding in Canaan and uh, it doesn't have a lot of views. So if any of your viewers would like to bump up those views, that helps my channel. But that is one time I definitely say, Hey, my experience as, as a law enforcement officer, uh, I got problems with Jesus decisions at the wedding in Canaan. Yeah. One thing you're going to find as a YouTuber is you're going to put in a lot of work on a video that you're really proud of and nobody watches it. And sometimes you're going to do something that just feels like an off the cuff thing and it'll just take off and there's no rhyme or reason to it. It's extremely yeah. frustrating for all of us. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, it's just part Super of it, you know. Yeah. Super chat comment. Somebody pointed out that Zod plus Dana can still be Zadanza. Sorry, Dan. <laughs> Okay, well, I got a new job. <laughs> and Paul Agia, you probably heard of him, seen him around. He's read Person of Interest. Oh, he's I great. Recommend. Yeah. Okay, so I got to say um, something about Paul Agia. He probably doesn't even know who I am, but he helped me more than anybody else because apparently on one of his uh, videos, he mentioned all the new YouTube uh, atheist YouTube channels, and he he put a thumbnail of mine, and that video just took off like i was like what's happening uh and it was all because of him so i owe that guy a big thank you and i think he he's one of these guys that really gets down in the nitty gritty of the new testament i really like that paul does a lot of things that are extremely tedious to me and that just makes me thankful that he's willing to do it because that's a that's an area i don't have expertise in and that I don't have the patience for. And he fleshes that out in a ton of detail. He, he read, um, ah, I'm forgetting the name now. That guy wrote that thousand page Magnum. Opus. Yeah. I'm, I'm like, wow. Oh my gosh. I've read I some big books. Man. <laughs> I like yeah. to read a lot, but a thousand pages, man. I don't know. I couldn't stick with something that long. Um, one thing I'll say real quick about uh, Jesus and being consequential. I do think he was one of the most Gary Habermas. Thank you, YouTube punk um, and critical snake. Uh, I think he was consequential in history. I don't necessarily think that reflects directly on him as a person or his accomplishments or what he said. I think that his personage or I'm not even a hundred percent a his a believer that he was historical. I'm not necessarily anywhere on the historical or mythical mm. 
I don't pick one side or the other. I think it's kind of complicated and hard to suss out. But yeah. I don't think that necessarily his being historically relevant or historically impactful was even a reflection on the person or character. Basically, he set a series of historical things into motion where a lot of other people made big impacts just kind of by an accident of history in large part. There was any number, any other number of teachers at the time who their ideas could have been picked up and um, passed along by the right political people, and they would have been more consequential. That's my perspective on that anyway. Yeah, no, I think that um, makes perfect sense. That you know, it could be Paul that is actually the guy who really made an impact of Christianity, or somebody that we don't even know. You know, um, about Jesus is just the guy who's getting credit for it. Um, yeah. All right, we'll proceed with this video here then and knock this out though. When a high impact event occurs, like the disappearance of a woman, it inevitably leaves a mark. It takes a while for the fuse to burn and the debris is difficult to miss. If someone killed Tammy, I expected the fuse to reveal more than who caused Tammy's disappearance. I expected the evidence in the fuse to explain why the killer chose that night in May of 2000. Why didn't he kill Tammy in January or June or September? Why 2000 instead of 1999? Was there a deadline unique to the killer? If only one person was involved in Tammy's disappearance, then the fallout should uniquely point to one suspect. If her husband's deed was guilty, then the debris should implicate him and no one else as the person of interest. If Steve killed Tammy, virtually every aspect of his world could eventually have been impacted. His future romantic relationships, the way he parented his kids, the topics he discussed with friends, the kinds of movies he preferred, where he lived, how much alcohol he drank, every aspect of Steve's life would tell us something about his involvement or lack of involvement. The fallout of Steve's life would help us to understand what happened and if Steve was involved in Tammy's disappearance. All right, so that's the end of that one. Any final thoughts about the rest? You know, that's just a bad movie. I don't even, uh, yeah, it's bad. You know, I, he spends a lot of time talking about st stuff like this. I really like, you know, he talks about how the apostles were these abused people, thrown in prison, beaten, um, eventually martyred for their faith. I like to talk about, you know, uh, in Acts chapter 10, how Peter is befriending this, you know, Roman centurion Cornelius, a really respected and rich man who bows at Peter's feet. You know, there's these stories about, oh, the apostles actually had a great deal of power. Let's talk about Acts chapter 10 and their friends that they were meeting with instead of, you know, I don't even know what he's trying to say here. That's not how detectives talk about a case at all in any way, shape or form. They talk about planning. Hey, we're going to go interview Steve. He, maybe he had something to do with this disappearance and they're going to, you know, um, plan out how they're going to do that and approach that. And it's really very serious because you want to try and get the truth out of Steve. And it might be very difficult to do if he did have something to do with it, but that's just not how that works in, in a law enforcement investigation. But all of this stuff about Wallace, he spends about half of his time talking about law enforcement anecdotes. I really like to bring up things about the New Testament in my videos. I, I do talk about my law enforcement career. I don't want to say I don't. But, but I really think it's really about the New Testament and what it says and why it's not true. <clears throat> and there's a lot of yeah. information there that I think proves that it's not true. Yeah, I think, I think that is getting more down to the point. I found it... Uh, I find that he tries, he uses it kind of as a distraction and he tries to, he's kind of taking you off on this big tangent that both makes him sound credible and gets your head swimming with all these other ideas. <laughs> and then before you know it, I think you're kind of associating, associating what you feel like, especially if you're a lay member of his audience who is kind of wanting to coax him along you kind of feel like there's more credibility or more was said by the time he switches over to the Bible. And then with minimal things being said about the actual, the actual topic, I don't know. I think he, the audience thinks he's done more than he has. Yeah. Well, clearly he's using an argument from expertise. It'd be like me coming in there and going, Hey, you know, the resurrection is a falsehood and I'm a retired police sergeant. Therefore, the resurrection is a falsehood. He's just putting a lot more language to it 
but that's generally his shtick. And I, you know, I, I do somewhat respect, um, uh, people like Frank Turk. Okay. So now everybody's freaking out what you could, but Frank Turk will get up there and take questions without any preparation. He will debate people. He does not hide behind his Christian audience. He will get out there and uh, he's done a lot of debates and he'll mix it up with people who adamantly disagree with him. And I sort of like that Wallace for all his police antidotes, a police officer's job is to go out there and confront the criminal element, which is dangerous and scary. And that's the job of a police officer. And he don't want to ever do that. He doesn't want to do debates. He doesn't take questions unless they're from, you know, a Christian audience. And uh, yeah, I, he's very much a desk cop. He's not a street cop. Now, in his law enforcement career, I think he probably worked on the street. But his a Christian apologetics career is analogous to some fat bureaucrat sitting behind a desk, you know, writing his signature on forms that need to be a, a, a approved. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure I share your respect for Frank Turk necessarily, but I yeah, get the I'm sure difference people don't. But I like that he goes <laughs> out there, though. And listen, I, you know, I yeah. don't want to overdo it because he doesn't tell the truth either. Uh, but if I had to go to war i'd pick frank turek over jay warner wallace yeah yeah he he has things built into his routine that's meant to put people on their uh set people back against the ropes and give kind of keep them on the defensive before they really get the chance to say anything unexpected but at least he's putting himself out there and talking to people wallace is probably the single most guarded apologist i've ever seen at work and yeah. He even, I mean, he massively, he massively robo blocks people before I was even, before anybody even knew who I was, he had blocked me on Twitter. Like, yeah, he has no, no use for being called to task on anything. I had a couple yeah. other clips, but I think we're going to, we're going to skip those. They were about different types of evidence and, um, his thoughts on, um, how you vet an eyewitness and things like that. Uh, I think we'd yeah, that's all nonsense we'll, we'll too, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, okay. Anyway, it, it, but it was I, more I, it was it was more fleshing out police nonsense, and I think we've done enough of that for now. So I'll I'll ask yeah, you a few we more questions, more. then we'll move on to the stuff you had prepared for us. Sure. Um, so a big I'd mentioned this to you before, but a big skill he claims uh is applying forensic statement analysis to the Bible. First off, what in general are your thoughts about forensic statement analysis? Yeah, so it is a real thing. Um, I was trained in forensic statement analysis, and I only we we had one case that we brought in an FBI guy, and he gave out um, it was a who done it homicide. I was not the lead investigator. I was a crimes against children investigator, but I worked for a small department. It was a significant murder that we had in our city. So everybody was kind of at least aware of it. I never worked on any of it. I was just aware of what was going on. And, you know, so he had everybody connected to the victim fill out these forms. And then he analyzed the forms to determine who was telling the truth and who was lying. And in that particular case, they got it totally wrong. They actually, we were able to solve that case. Um, about nine months to a year after the, the murder occurred, uh, and the suspect was not who the FBI had suspected that the suspect was. So uh, I am very skeptical of forensic statement analysis. I have a YouTube video um, on my channel right now, and it talks about a forensic analysis of the Gospels. And I do a forensic statement analysis of John's Gospel. I hope people find it interesting. But in the video, I make a very strong point to point out it's Detective Wallace who believes in forensic statement analysis. He's the one that's fascinated with it. He's the one that used it all the time, and he's the one that fell in love with it. Personally, I'm very skeptical of it. But if you do a forensic statement analysis of John's gospel, uh, and I do this thing, you will find that whoever wrote this is not an eyewitness to any of this stuff that happened. Um, and also point out some dishonesty from Detective Wallace because he changes all the pronouns around. And it is kind of interesting. Um, so you know, if people want to check that out. But forensic statement analysis is mostly used by insurance companies who are trying to get out of a claim 
So they will, you know, if somebody's home burned down, they'll have them write out what happened with their home burning down. And some expert will come in and tell the person, your home didn't burn down. You lit it on fire. We're going to deny your claim, you know, and it's all part of the negotiation yeah. process. Um, I don't think it's admissible in court uh, any more than a polygraph examination is. We have all these systems to try and figure out how if people are telling the truth or not. And none of them are 100 percent accurate. They might be useful tools in, in some ways, though. So I wouldn't just totally discard it. But I'm skeptical of it. And we don't yeah, use it I've, in municipal law enforcement. Most of what I've heard was range from skepticism to calling it a full on pseudoscientist pseudoscience. Um, mm -hmm. depends, I think a lot on what you want to do with it. And I think there's a little bit of wiggle room in what you call forensic statement analysis. Like, I think what you do, I would not personally consider that forensic statement analysis as much as just basically analyzing the text, like breaking down what was yeah. said. I think there's a fine line and I don't even know if there's a really clear definitive difference. But what you point out is just really clear contradictions or really clear clues indicating what the person was writing about, who was writing about it. I think there's a big difference between that and trying to get this big, huge, big, huge narrative about the fact that somebody was full on lying or something from all these tiny little clues. Uh, I don't know. But that all said, what do you think of the idea of forensic statement analysis or any other form of detective work? being applicable to analyzing ancient texts and determining things about the ancient world or Jesus. Is there like anything there at all? Yeah. I, okay, I can't speak to people who are highly trained in analyzing ancient texts. I can only speak to law enforcement. We don't get any training in that at all. And, um, yeah. you know, we know how to read and write and we have common sense and judgment. And, you know, so we can use those skills that everybody else has as well. But, there's no argument from expertise because you were a law enforcement officer. Um, occasionally there might be something though. And I, you know, Jesus's use of wine kind of, maybe I impacted that more than some people would based on my experiences, but an alcoholic or somebody who'd lost a family member to an alcohol related accident, they would have had the same, the same viewpoint as mine. So, um, yeah, I, I don't, that doesn't really apply at all. Um, you know, you're talking about ancient documents. We have bits and pieces of this one that get mixed with bits and pieces of that one. They're written in a different language at a very different time in history than what we're experiencing today. So that is a very complicated science uh, that police officers are not trained in at all. But that doesn't mean that we can't, you know, read books and have an opinion on it, just like anyone else. Yeah, I think there's, I think there are different things. One is like what I do. And I think partly what you do is take the books of the Bible at face value in their current English translations and address it in terms of what fundamentalists, if, fun, if fundamentalists take that as the word of God, inerrant as it's been passed on to them, you can address that in those terms without thinking that you're actually deducing things about the actual authors of it and the textual history and stuff like that. And that's where I think Wallace is overstepping in thinking detective work has anything to do with actually concluding historical things from these documents that were all written by people in a completely different culture and completely different languages, trying to even arrive at conclusions about who wrote those using purely just detective work versus all the very deep uh, academic knowledge and even knowledges of the languages and stuff. I find that a little bit absurd or a lot absurd actually. <laughs> yes. And you know, I go back to this point. I don't mean to be too redundant, but detective work is about being honest and ethical and talking about all the mm -hmm. evidence. And so detective Wallace does not do that when he's talking about, you know, this common sort of rote Christian apologetics is the apostles had nothing to gain from any of this. And I'm like, well, have you read Acts chapter five and this famous, fascinating story of Ananias and Sapphira, Peter and John are having money laid at their feet. And then if you go look at the report from a different witness, how Wallace would call it in that in first Corinthians. So in Acts chapter five, you have this wealthy community of landowners in the early Christian church. And when they sell off a parcel of land, they donate that money to the church and the money does get redistributed to anybody that had a need. So it's kind of this kind of socialist 
society that they've created, but it's Peter and John who are, you know, get the money. It's laid at their feet. And then in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul is writing, those who preach the gospel have the, the Lord commands that they be allowed to make a living from the gospel. And those who serve at the author, author those who serve at the altar have a right to the proceeds of the altar, or share of the altar. So if you're serving at the altar, like Peter and John, the people are laying in their money at their feet, you get to share in that. Look at their, ultimately, this is what they're doing for a living. They're financially dependent on the early church and tithing and people, you know, making their living from spreading the gospel. That creates a bias. You know, when your job and livelihood depends on something, you do have a reason to lie. It doesn't mean that you are lying, but it's wrong to say they had no reason to lie because they did. And their 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 livelihood was dependent on growing going. And these two kind of scripture verses give evidence of that, that you're not really going to ever hear a Christian apologist talk about. And when they get hit up with this, they've got a ready-made excuse. No, 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 Ananias and Sapphira, that's about lying to the Holy Spirit, you know, and I've got a whole lot to say about that too. But it's a very yeah. fascinating story, um, and there's a lot of little nuances in it. I do find that very interesting to talk about and, and read up on and studying. A lot of people think I'm out of my mind, like who would read the New Testament like this? I think it's cool, <laughs> you know, in, in that way. I, I I find it interesting too. I think the big thing is when when apologists apologists are playing a different game than you are. I don't think you're really trying to dig down and deduce things in absolute terms about their motives. Correct me if, if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. but all, all all really we have to do is show that there's some kind of counterexample because I find it extremely dubious when you look at, even if you take a story at face value much less consider the fact that the story might be true as written. When you deduce that people, especially far removed from you in a different culture with different values and different ways of thinking, could not have done something because there'd be no motivation to do that. I, I find that just extremely tenuous. Like people could surprise us in all kinds of ways. There could, mm -hmm. They can have all kinds of motivations that we would just never guess at. And that's even taking the story at face value, which is a big leap. So what I like about what you do is you're not really beholden, I don't think, to come up with an exact narrative about why they would do what they do, why there'd be an element of greed. But I like that you uncover that there are at least hints there that there would be some possible motivation. And so you can't nail it down to, well, they just ended up dying and getting persecuted. And, you know, why would anybody do that? There's no, you know, no reason. Yeah, right. You know, this is interesting, too, because if you read the 28th chapter of Acts, that's the very last chapter of the book of Acts is chapter 28. The last four verses, 31 through 32, I believe, or 31 through 34, the last verses of Acts has Paul, you know, who Christian apologists say is beaten up, hit with rods, thrown in prison, shipwrecked. Um, ultimately martyred for his faith. But the very last chapter of Acts says, no, Paul lived in a rented house, having visitors come over and that he preached the gospel and for a two year period of time. So there is a time limit on this um, without any hindrance at all. Everybody should do this right now. Just, you know, Google search Acts 28. Look at the very last couple of lines and you're seeing some evidence. Know that Paul, this guy who's supposed to be, you know, martyred for his faith is actually the the book of Acts ends with him doing quite well and, and being in a very comfortable situation, you know, and, and this is never discussed. And that's why I like to bring that stuff up. It's just, it's, I'm sort of the defense attorney. Now I've, I've left police work and, and, and the Christian apologists or the prosecutors, and I'm the one, you know, poking holes in their case. All right. So one last question and let's get to your video. Um, Wallace uh, seems to think biblical contradictions are not a big deal and actually thinks it can strengthen the case for the gospels being true because, you know, it just means that they're acting like any other witnesses who are going to tell different perspectives and have slightly different stories based on their memories. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so 
Uh, Vincent Blagosi might be the most famous prosecutor in American history. He's the prosecutor that uh, prosecuted Charles Manson. He wrote a book about Christianity called Divinity of Doubt, which is probably to Christian people the most offensive book that's ever been written. But in that book, and I agree with Vincent Blagosi about this, when you see some contradictions in witness statements, that actually could be an indication that those people are telling the truth, that they're giving their perception of what happened during a, a traumatic event, and they're honestly giving their memory of that traumatic event, and they're contradicting one another. They're not remembering the, the event the same way. Um, it's probably more problematic, and I have a video on this, when their stories are too similar to one another, it's much more likely that the, the, that's dishonesty. And that's what you see in the Gospels. You know, you kind of hear people occasionally talking about, oh, well, some of it's word for word. No, a lot of it's word for word. And when you start putting them, you know, side by side, Matthew's Gospel, Mark's Gospel, and Luke's Gospel, and you start highlighting the word for word phrases, it doesn't take long at all before you're going, these guys are plagiarizing one another. And that's a sign of dishonesty. So contradictions can ruin your case because they create doubt. If two witnesses are telling the, a different story, well, which one of the witnesses is accurate? It doesn't mean they're lying that they're telling different stories, but which one is accurate? That creates a little bit of doubt as to what actually happened. And if you get too much doubt, well, you don't have a case. Um, and then you cannot speculate to resolve these contradictions. This is very common in Christian apologetics is, you know, you have uh, the death of Judas Iscariot. In Matthew's gospel, Judas Iscariot hangs himself. In the book of Acts, Judas Iscariot falls into a field and he bursts open and his guts go spilling all over the field. So which one of those death stories is the one that's true and accurate? What's very common for apologists to do is they just speculate. It's self-serving speculation. They say, no, Judas hanged himself, and then the rope broke after he had decomposed, and he fell, and his guts burst open. And that's both of those things are actually true. And that might have actually, that could, that's plausible, right? Maybe that's what happened, but it's self-serving speculation. We don't know that's what happened. It's just an idea of what happened. It's also possible that Luke heard an oral tradition about the death of Judas Iscariot, and he wrote it down in an ancient book. And then Luke or Matthew heard a different story about an oral tradition, and he wrote a different story down in a different ancient book. That's also plausible. So which one of those things are true? Christians have decided that the Gospels are true, and so everything to them, you you resolve contradictions in a way that helps your case. Whereas I really try and be objective in there. So, okay, what are the different possibilities? And you find out that these contradictions probably, they just have too many different possibilities that we don't actually know what happened. Yeah, I find it very strange, too, that anybody would write an account of somebody hanging himself in the rope breaking without including the part where he like actually hung himself. It seems like a strange part to start, <laughs> strange place to start the story, but. Uh, yeah, it's a weird place I, to start I, the story. <laughs> what I find interesting about this is, I think that's an extremely strange thing for Wallace to say, is that we should expect some contradictions as if these are just different people telling stories and he gets something's wrong. Because I think he's, I think he would be a biblical literalist, or at least he wants to appeal to biblical literalists. So if you're assuming that your audience is actually thinking about what you say and is going to hold your feet to the fire, it would be very strange to say that what is supposed to be a unified story perfectly inspired by God is going to have contradictions because these are different people making mistakes. It's, I don't know, I feel like he's kind of trying to play both sides. Like, uh, make an insinuation about how different witnesses would ask and hope his audience isn't noticing that this doesn't really comport with, you know, a perfectly inspired inerrant word of God. Yeah. So I, I would, I would maybe push back. I think fundamentalism is kind of dead. I, I, Wallace may not be totally popular in fundamentalist audiences. He's more maybe popular in Southern California evangelical audience seems audiences where, you know, know that they resolve these contradictions with self-serving speculation. Um, but 
witnesses now he makes it sound like witnesses always contradict each other that's not true either that's an exaggeration uh but witnesses in that see like a car accident or they see a robbery no it is common for there to be contradictory statements i can think of all kinds of examples that is not uncommon when you see a car accident you are probably going to give a slightly different statement as to what happened than a person who was across the street seeing the same car accident just by, you know, the way emergencies and, and uh, you know, uh, cases that involve a lot of emotional uh, impact happen. So I don't immediately think that people are lying because they're contradicting one another. A lot of sometimes what a detective has to do is exactly figure out why they're contradicting one another. And we do that by re-interviewing them, by going and taking a second look at crime scenes or accident scenes. And we have to figure out, okay, why is there a contradiction here? Can we explain it? And if there's too many contradictions that we cannot explain, we do not have a case that can go to court. It can't be prosecuted because yeah. there's too much doubt. But I don't immediately think that contradictions mean people are lying or that something didn't happen. Uh, because I, I have seen that in law enforcement. Witnesses do contradict each other. That's common. Paul has something I hadn't heard before. Wallace said God allowed those mistakes so the testimony would ring true to future generations, which that's, <laughs> yeah, I think so that's you, about a, yeah. a, as prime a possible example of somebody reaching to come up with whatever explanation works. Yes, right. Um, now, that's kind of funny. That's clever. That's what a Christian would say. <laughs> yeah. We're about an hour and 15 in, so let's dive into this video that you brought us and let you share your comments. Um, I have a couple places marked where I was planning on stopping um, that you said you had some things to say. But if you have anything you want to say, just feel free to gesture or start talking and I'll pause the video for you. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm um, oh, oh, yeah. Yes. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I thought you were going to have me play that video and I was going to admit, hey, I don't have the technical skills, but you've got it fired up. So let's go ahead and listen to this. Okay, cool. Sir, what's your name? Scott. Scott, go ahead. All right, so uh, I'm not an atheist, and uh, I think you're pretty funny. I enjoyed your presentation. Um, so these questions I'm going to ask, I don't want to have like a debate. I'm just interested. There were questions I thought sure. of uh, as you were speaking. So I've made up lies to make myself look worse. Um, it's to give others like peace of mind or to make them feel better. Uh, maybe I'm playing like a game with somebody, and I play worse, so I will make them have more fun to make the game more fun for everybody. Right, but that would be the exception rather than the rule, right? You wouldn't make up, you, you wouldn't make yourself look bad in a, uh, in a format like the New Testament where you're trying to tell the truth about what happened to Jesus and you wouldn't, I wouldn't think anyway, you wouldn't go forward with suggesting that you were dim-witted and that you ran away while the women were the first witnesses and and it just seems to me it would be improbable for any group of people to do that. Well, so I just, I find this really interesting for a couple of reasons. Number one, the whole criterion of embarrassment thing. I don't know. I find that a little strange because who knows, number one, if the care, if the people written in these stories are actually the ones writing these books, maybe they're just using other people or other characters as an object lesson. But I love what he said when he said, um, People who are trying to tell the truth about Jesus, different people might lie, but people trying to tell the truth about Jesus wouldn't lie. And like, isn't that the whole point that we're wondering whether these people were trying to tell the truth or whether they knew enough to tell the truth? Like, I don't yeah, know. It's. I think, I, I, think I just, I just thought it was weird that he just he just slipped it, slipped in the in, in assumption that they were telling the truth as a reason. I don't know. Go ahead. Yeah, I've just started to kind of study Frank Turek a little bit, so I don't know too much about him. The one thing, though, is he is up on a stage and he is taking questions. And this guy asking him a question is a pretty bright dude. He's not some idiot, you know. I mean, he's got some interesting things to say. And uh, Jay Warner Wallace would never be taking questions like that. Uh, he's never done anything that like that in his whole apologetics career. But I think Frank might be alluding to a little bit, you know, that the uh, the the gospel authors wrote things down that are embarrassing to them. Uh, a big deal is made out of uh, that no gospel author would have would have written down that women were the ones that um, were first seeing Jesus resurrected and finding his empty tomb. It's Mary Magdalene that's you know the one who's the key player in this. 
because that's kind of embarrassing. Nobody would believe women. And they would have, if they were lying about it, they would have written that men went and found the empty tomb and, and had Jesus appear to them. Um, so this is kind of an argument from embarrassment that, and they're more likely to be telling the truth because it was women going there and women were not really treated as, as people that could be witnesses. But what, 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 what's frustrating about this is, is if you just read the stories, nobody believes the women. They all think that they're just talking gibberish and, you know, hysterical about the whole thing. They don't even believe them. And, and, and then Peter and John are the ones that, you know, basically race each other to go verify the empty tomb. And, and it really kind of shows the men that go there. They, they believe that Jesus has risen from the dead in John's gospel just by seeing the empty tomb itself. They don't even see Jesus and they, they immediately believe it. You know, so I, I, this argument from embarrassment is really, um, there's a whole lot more to it. People don't believe the, 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 the women and the men immediately believe it based on very little evidence other than the empty tomb. And I don't really think the, I think the whole empty tomb thing is a legendary story that never even really happened. It's just something that was made up yeah. in the oral traditions, you know, that, that, that there was no empty tomb. You know, Jesus was probably very summarily executed by crucifixion, probably along with a couple of his apostles too. I think these two thieves, I have this totally speculative, can't prove it, but you know, it's an idea that some those two thieves were probably some of his fellow apostles, rebel rousers, you know, that were, um, you know, probably a little bit more violent when you read about Jesus' arrest. Somebody gets their ear cut off during that arrest. There's some violence. They have swords. Um, they draw their swords, you know, and if, if the Jewish Sanhedrin are going to arrest them and then the Romans find out, eh, these guys, they're kind of like rebels, man. They're trying to take over. Just kill them. Just kill them right out, you know, and maybe those two thieves were some of Jesus's followers. I think that's kind of an interesting you know, historical thing. We don't have enough information to make that statement. I've been talking a lot, uh, but I think what Frank's talking about is the gospel authors included facts that if they were lying, they would have excluded like women finding the tomb. Uh, but he doesn't mention that nobody believes the women anyway. So, <clears throat> yeah. Well, hey, we're, we're here to let you talk and, you know, give everyone a sample of what you do. So feel free to go sure. at it. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think they're, I think they're legendary stories myself. Like I think these were probably written after the fact by church fathers who probably weren't even the characters in the story. So it's all irrelevant anyway, but there are so many steps you have to take to get from what you see in the story to the fact that not only did those not only were those people writing about themselves, but they would never write that X, Y, and Z happened because it's embarrassing. You don't know any of that stuff. And and to hang and to hang your belief in the supernatural on something that thin, it's you're obviously just working backwards, but That's yeah, so my next when part. you're okay. So there's oh, yeah. oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, you're well, you're talking plan? about these super supernatural claims, you know. Um Frank Turk, I've noticed that he's got like a couple of kind of meme phrases that he rattles off very quickly, you know, very quickly. And I think, so I've come up with a couple of meme phrases too. And it talks to these legendary stories, but also, you know, Genesis is Genesis is mistake and Deuteronomy is barbaric. Jesus had a failed prophecy of the end times and the arrival of God's kingdom. The resurrection is a legend and the ascension is a myth that, you know, I want to start rattling off some of these things too, as a starting point for a debate. So, you know, Frank's always rattling this stuff off. I think that we might be self, you know, better served to have a few memes that we rattle off too that are in contrast to what the apologist is rattling off so that we can start a discussion and a debate. Okay, you just said something and I've said something and those things are diametrically in opposition to one another. So we're going to have to ferret this out. Um, and all too often they rattle off their thing and everybody goes, oh, that sounds pretty good. And, you know, it's, you know, open wide and here comes the spoon and you just swallow it down without <laughs> any real critical thought, without any real yeah. critical, critical thought. So in a way, I think, you know, I'm trying to come up with some memes to rattle off to, to create a discussion where there is no discussion without that. I think the ascension is a myth, who... though are not homeless, but yeah. they pretend they're homeless. Um, and then they lie about who they are and they say, you know, I'm not good at life. This is me on the street because they want to get money from people. 
That's so right. Can you see how other people would lie to make themselves? Yeah, lie? but if you look at what the New Testament writers, what did they get out of doing this? In fact, my friend Jay Warner Wallace is a cold case homicide detective. Um, he and I do some seminars together. You've seen him on Dateline because he's been on Dateline five times solving murders that are decades old. He says when he finds a dead body, there's only three reasons why that body's dead. There's not, you don't walk in and find a dead body and go, there's a thousand reasons this guy's killed. No, there's only three or a combination thereof. Sex, money, or power, or some combination thereof, okay? Now I ask you, those are the motivations for conspiracies. Sex, money, or power. Did the disciples get chicks by saying this happened? Did okay, you have some notes at this point. So what are your thoughts? Oh, uh, well, you know, I just, you know, okay. So he's, you know, my friend Jay Warner Wallace is a cold case homicide detective. He's on Dateline solving murders that are 20 years old. Well, listen, Frank, I was a supervisor of detectives. I know more than Jay Warner Wallace, and he's full of crap. So now we have a discussion to talk about here about, you know, who's right. So he's rattling off this meme, and everybody's just going, oh, wow, he knows a guy that's a homicide detective. You know, he knows what he's talking about. Um, he's talking about sex. I think we need to play the video just a little bit more. I will say this. I do not see any evidence or you know, I, I investigated crimes against children, which very often involve sexual violence against children. And I'm not seeing anything in the gospels that, uh, that this was about sex or, or, you know, the oppression of women. I actually think that a lot of the things Jesus said might've been very intriguing to first century Jewish women who had no rights or power at all. And he was constantly, you know, or he's depicted as constantly going around talking about the meek would inherit the earth. So I don't think it's about sex, but he's about to, to talk a little bit about what I do think it's about. And that's money and power and the ability to terrorize people so that you can get them to do what you want them to do. Okay. Yeah, we'll finish this up so you can. Did they get power this. by saying it happened. Did they get money by saying it happened? No. In fact, they were thrown out of their lofty position in Judaism, particularly Paul, who was in a very big position of power. He was persecuting the church, and he became persecuted because of it. So he didn't do it, and the apostles didn't appear to do it for any of those normal reasons you do to commit any kind of conspiracy or crime. So my first question, you know, is for Frank Turek. Well, okay. What about in Acts chapter 10, you're saying that they didn't get any power at all, no power at all. Cornelius, a Roman centurion's bowing at Peter's feet. In Acts chapter five, Peter and, and John are having money laid at their feet. And then Ananias and Sapphira fall dead at their feet. And that puts this great fear throughout the whole church. That's what it says. And there's a, so Peter is creating this great fear throughout his own church. That is incredible levels of power when you can interact with people and create great fear, which is what it says. I mean, there's things right there in the New Testament, a couple of little brief examples of they were actually gaining power. Um, at least the stories that are in the New Testament depict this as, as, as gaining power. He talks about Paul. You know, he mentioned Paul. Oh, persecuted, persecuted. He was removed from power. That's not what Acts 28, the last couple of verses of, of the book of Acts even says. He was living a very comfortable life, you know, having visitors and preaching the gospel without hindrance. So, you know, we have there's other evidence that you're not going to hear from Frank Turek or Jay Warner Wallace. I've talked a little bit about power and money already today. Um, so I don't want to be too redundant on that. But when he says they had nothing to gain, they weren't getting sex, they weren't getting power, they weren't getting money, he's wrong about the power and the money part. Um, and he's wrong about terrorizing people too, because the story of Ananias and Sapphira is purely about terrorizing people uh, because they didn't give the whole tithe that they had agreed to give. <clears throat> Yeah. Yeah, they can say that story was about lying, but it's an interesting coincidence that the lie happened to be around money and how much you give to the church. Yeah, and it's really not about lying either, because my my follow up question to that is, well, how do you know it's about lying, Frank? Because the only source of it being about lying is from Peter. 
Ananias, is, uh, his thoughts are not depicted in it at all. And it does look like Sapphira probably did lie to Peter, but Peter's the source of this lie. He's also the guy that's getting the money laid at his feet. So it's a little bit like, you know, he's got something to gain uh, by making up this story. It's about lying. Yeah, there's there are just so many motivations that you could never that you could never know are at play here. Um, and again, this is this is if you take the stories at face value, which I don't, there are so many reasons why the people could have behaved the way they did, even in the stories. There are so many more reasons why somebody could have come up with a story like that, or, you know, the roots behind that story could have had human motivations. And I just find it incredibly audacious to think that you could just narrow down. Well, I'm so sure that nobody would behave like this, that the only explanation is that someone rose from the dead and was God. Like that's, in, that's crazy thinking. Uh, yeah, that is crazy thinking. And, I guess one of my things is, is though, when I hear these, these arguments and they leave out stuff that is actually in the new Testament, uh, I want to bring that up. One of the, one of the, the things that you learn as a rookie police officer, when you go to court and you're going to testify, whether it be on a traffic ticket that you wrote or a, a burglary case that you made an arrest in a drunk driving case, you have to know your report inside and out. You cannot get confused on the stand or when you're talking. Um, you have to be able to answer questions and you have to be able to answer questions accurately. And if you don't add, answer them accurately, you are going to pay a very quick and mean public price in front of this courtroom full of people. You're going to look bad and you're going to be embarrassed. Um, and I think all too often people haven't actually read these stories thoroughly enough to really be able to talk about them in great detail. And I think that's an important part of it. Um, and part of my YouTube channel, trying to really get down into the nitty gritty. Now, some people might not like that at all, you know, getting down into the weeds and, and, and analyzing a single sentence. Um, but I use that to show how the apologist is not giving you all the information that there's more to the story than what you're being told. Cool. Well, we are pretty close to the end of our time here, and I wanted to give you one last chance. Um, first off, for those who are still here, especially if you came in late, um, I want to hype this up. Go to Sergeant Skeptic's channel. The link is in the description. Check it out. I think you'll like what you see. Um, I said at the beginning, he has a, a style that's somewhat similar to mine, where it's very factual, um, breaks down the text on its own terms, and really hits on some things in the text, untangles some little bits of wording that show you things that you might not have noticed were there. Um, and I've, I've found that pretty revealing and I think you will too. Um, before we close out, do you have anything specific that you have coming down the works that you want to kind of let people know are coming? Rouse the curiosity yeah. a little bit? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm working on it now. I, I, I script everything out, you know, and I research everything pretty well too. I don't want to make a comment in a video that I can't actually back up. You know, if somebody calls me out on it, I want to be able to go and I research this and at least, at least be able to defend my, my position. Um, so I'm very careful about that. Uh, but I'm working on, everybody paints Luke as this master historian. Why well, I tell you, Luke was a crap meteorologist. And I'm going to start point, my next thing project, and uh, hopefully I'll get that uploaded in you know next three weeks to a month. I do take a long time to do things. Um, it's going to show how Luke was just simply mistaken, that he actually didn't know what he was talking about. And I plan on pointing out all these things that he gets wrong. Um, and that this whole master historian thing is really a big red herring that, that doesn't have anything to do with anything. He reports some mundane facts that he had access to knowing and the things that he didn't understand about the natural world, he gets those absolutely wrong. And so I think it'll be a, a fun thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, hopefully some audience members will like what I do. And it's my understanding that it helps me if you subscribe to my channel and if you like the video and if you watch it all the way through so you know that's my pitch to you if you want to help out that would be the way to help out if you're if you're paying taxes you're already helping me out financially so don't ever give me any money because i got a very lucrative retirement system from the taxpayers of california um, but if you do want to help out hey watch these video like it and subscribe and that would be awesome all right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you being here. It was fun to pick your brain and see your perspective on this. I hope you guys all enjoyed it too. And um, yeah, go 
check his videos out, subscribe, like them, comment, do all that stuff. And uh, we'll hope to get him a little more exposure because I think he has some good things to say. But that all said, good Thank night, you. everybody. And I appreciate you walking, watching. And thanks, Sergeant Skeptic, again for joining us. Thank you. Voy a cantar esta canción con mucho cariño de mi corazón a la República Dominicana, la casa del merengue y la casa de la bachata. Voy a cantar esta canción con mucho cariño de mi corazón a la República Dominicana, la casa del merengue y la casa de la bachata. La La casa del merengue, la, 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 y la casa de la bachata.